Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 296, featuring the first in a new interview series with Dr. Richard Bartle, the co-creator of MUD, multi-user dungeon, the first massively multiplayer online role-playing game. This was well before uh, World of Warcraft and EverQuest and uh, games of that type, and it was all in text, but it was very ahead of its time, and it was awesome. I'm sure a lot of you guys probably played some of these MUDs back in the day. Anyway, I really had a great time uh, with uh, Dr. Bartle. Uh, we talk about all kinds of topics, stuff you probably are not expecting to hear in an interview like this, but uh, I really like the way that it turned out, and I think you will too. So, without further ado, here is Dr. Richard Bartle. All right, folks, I am here with the great Dr. Richard Bartle. He's the writer, co-creator of MUD, the game that pretty much laid the foundations for all of the later MUDs, of course, and the MMO RPGs to follow, games like World of Warcraft, EverQuest. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, he's also a professor of computer game design at Essex University and a consultant to the games industry. So how are you doing today, Richard? I'm doing fine, thank you. It's a real honor oh. to have you on the show. Uh, You're just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was looking at this uh, website of yours, and you're quite a, a <sighs> prolific guy. My God, I mean, there's a lot of material up there. That's only because I've lived a lot longer than you have. <laughs> <laughs> I got sort of hung up for a while on those uh, stereoscopic pictures. Mm. I think there's one of uh, Colchester Castle on there. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of those. I take them the whole time. But only a few of them ever make it to the website because... I'm kind of lazy, but eventually I'll put more up. Yeah, those things, it always amazes me when you finally look at it just the right way and the picture sort of, I mean, it's, it's pretty weird. In fact, I have no idea how that works, uh, you know, visually, <laughs> what it must be going. I guess it's a mental phenomenon, right? Yes, it's just a brain picking up two images, one for each eye, and then thinking, oh my goodness, oh, these don't look like two images, and putting them together into one. So it's, uh, I mean, I, I, I can do it. For, some people get headaches after a while, but I've never had a headache in my life, so I can do it indefinitely. So it's, uh, it's easy for me, but other people, um, it's okay for a while, but then you start, they start um, feeling queasy or whatever. Headaches involve mm. probably achy heads. <laughs> Yeah, you always hear that about the nausea from 3D. That seems to be a... I'm glad I don't suffer from that because I love those stereoscopic images too. I notice you do a lot of uh, fiction as well. People probably don't know that. Maybe maybe they don't know that about you, but you got some novels and some uh, Yeah, yeah, stories. yeah. Well, yes, I've, 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 the reason they don't know about them is because um, nobody buys them because, <laughs> you know, in order to get fiction published, you pretty well have to be famous or well, you're have already had some. <laughs> I'm not famous in the in in a sense appreciated by um the the public publishing industry let's put it that way yeah um because if they've never if they've never heard of me then obviously no one's heard of me the thing is that there's so many people who've written fiction I mean you get these um write a book in a month things every year so so much fiction coming out that um if you're a, a book publisher, then you're you're not looking for good fiction. You're looking for a reason not to accept everything that comes your way. So the slightest reason not to do it, and um, and and you're gone. So uh, if if you're famous enough that they've heard of you, you're fine. If you've already published a book, you're fine. If you've got an agent, you're fine. Um, or if you work for a book publisher, you're also fine. Um, but to get an agent, you have to be famous or know an agent or work for an agent. And, and so, you know, it's it's quite a, quite difficult. So, yeah, but I write the stories not because I'm actually intending to get them published, although we can hope, but, uh, but because I've got this story and I just want to write it. So I do. So, yeah. And what's your what story or novel do you think is your best work so far? Story or novel? Uh, Hmm. Well, obviously it's the one I'm working on at the moment <laughs> um, which is the second in a series that I already wrote the first one for actually I, I did manage to sell 200 copies of that on um, hmm. on, kin on the Kindle so at least I, I've either got 200 friends or those that free set of advertising that I got off Google once suddenly brought me 200 people who accidentally clicked on the link or something i don't know but uh it's 
that that one's a young adult fiction thing. But um, I've got other ones that I really, really liked writing and really liked reading. And sadly, I'm not the person who uh, gets to decide whether they get published or not. So, yeah. Notice that you also have done some, uh, I guess, JavaScript games or browser-based games on there people can play. Yeah, yeah, but they're just for fun, like, 15 years ago. <laughs> it uh, only took me a day each or two days, something like that. Then you've got some Civ maps or some civilization yeah. maps. You you have been looking at my website, haven't you? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm... <laughs> it's almost like you do research. Yeah, it was a huge website. I... Oh yeah, well, well. I was like, um, well, what is it? I mean, it seems like you've done a little bit of everything. I mean, you've got uh, these civilization maps up that people yeah, can yeah, download. Yeah. And civilization three. I, I mean, take it you're a pretty big fan of the series. Um, yeah, I quite like Civilization. Yes, because it's well, Civilization three and two. They were the, they were kind of the best. Civilization four, not so good. Civilization five, uh, um, but um, you didn't like yeah, Civilization yeah. five. No, I don't like the Civilization five. What's, what's um, the matter with it? Well, if you've got archers in England, they can't fire across the English Channel to France, realistically. <laughs> um, but in civilization, uh, because they've got this... Sorry sorry if you're not a civilization fat, but they've, they've got this range thing going on now. So you can have archers and they'll fire um, like two hexes away. But the trouble is that a hex isn't a fixed amount. So a hex in an interstellar thing could be, you know, galaxies. Or, um, and, but if it's set on Earth, then a hex could be just, just a few miles away or it could be across the English Channel or it could be across the um, Red Sea or something. You know, it, it could be any size. And you, you, let's shoot a hex, let, let's shoot an arrow from Madagascar to um, mainland Africa. Well, no, you know. No. So that, that's one thing I don't like. I also don't like the... Um, separate cities that they've got um, every time i play it now I, I, I turn off the uh um city states option because i don't like them um, they they get upset if you kill them and uh, <laughs> yeah anyway. in the same way <laughs> i was uh one of the essays i saw there you were talking i think it was i didn't write down what magazine this was for i think it was maybe one of the science fiction mags uh, but they were talking to you about the uh virtual reality which was kind of interesting because i believe the article was either in the 80s or the 90s and you were talking about this and you had a nice little twist on what you know i won't spoil the ending for you I'll, uh, for the viewers out there I'll put oh a link, yeah link to it, but, uh, the, the, the future uh, of artificial uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, virtual reality yes yeah <laughs> uh, but i'm just well, wondering if you'd had a chance to play around with oculus rift or any of the uh, new sort of augmented reality stuff that's coming out lately no i haven't had a chance to play around with them um, because if I did have them, I would feel obliged to have to take a student on to do something with it. So uh, at the moment, no, no, um, it's the sort of thing where, um, much as I'd like to have a go at it, especially with the th um, since I like three D, um, it it's not something that I've uh, I've got anything I can do with it at the moment. You know, I'd have to take it, I'd have to start developing it uh, with it my uh, on myself, um, which. I kind of like to do, but basically that's the sort of thing. Well, why would I do that when I can have a, I was going to say slave, but I think students probably, the, <laughs> when I can have a student do that um, as a family, a project and, um, and then they they can do all the, the hard stuff and, and I don't have to have to do that anymore. So that's kind of the way I'm, I'm looking at it. Um, I didn't, I didn't put any money into it cause I didn't think you know, on the Kickstarter cause I didn't think it was actually going to get funded. <laughs> Shows you how much I know about, uh, about that still i think a lot of us kind of assume that stuff was dead you know at the time but then it suddenly just seemed uh, to be this huge resurgence of it and no i, I always knew it was gonna that the, the 3d was stuff was going to come back because there's nowhere else to go is there if you're doing vision there's nowhere else you can go but 3d and once you can um see which direction the eyes are pointing so that you don't end up with people having diverging eyes like they did in the 1950s 3D movies, um, then you should be okay with that. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, I, I always knew you were going to get it. Like, okay, so it's the Oculus Rift looks like that's going to be the one, but who knows? And, and the, other, the other thing is you, you never know when a blindingly obvious idea is not going to make it because somebody took out a patent in 1997 that stops it from 
being made until all the patent runs out or something. There's all these um, nasty little... Not a big fan touches. of the intellectual property law, huh? Uh, I'm not a fan of it being given out for things which it shouldn't be given out for, which is pretty well most of it. But um, at least in the UK, you can't patent software, so that's good. But in the US, you can. Uh, I mean, and, and passing things off, things like the, the, the notorious one-click one, buy, buy with one click on, on Amazon. Why is that ever patented? Why? Yeah. How does that promote progress, right? <laughs> well, um, I don't think the, the patent office is is there to promote progress. I think it's probably there in order to promote its own existence. Because if you if you get your funding, like the U.S. Patent Office does, from the patents that you award, you know, people pay you to award the patents. Well, you're going to award patents, aren't you? Um, maybe if they uh, if they had to pay if a patent ever got broken, then then that might wake them up a bit. But um, I don't think you can force government agencies through the courts in America like that. So uh, anyway. So if you had the opportunity to have uh, patented MUDs, you mm. know, and made, I guess, billions of dollars at this point from the... No, no, I had the opportunity um, and I said no. Um, we, we could have um, clamped some intellectual property on it, but the reason that Roy and I wrote MUD wasn't to make money. It was because we wanted to make the real world a better place. And the way to do that isn't by clamping down on intellectual property and stopping anybody else from making them. The, the way to do that is to give it away for free and let other people do what they want with it. So that's what we did. I mean, um, I was a student at a university. My Back then, we didn't have to pay any fees. It was all, um, we got a grant. And the taxpayers had effectively paid Roy and I to make this thing. So it would have been rather um, cheating on them if we had said, oh, thanks for paying us uh, to make this thing. And now we're going to uh, m make all the money and you don't get any taxpayers. Ha ha. It sucks mm. to be you. Kind of like Kickstarter um, almost. Huh? Well, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> If we were the kind of people who wanted to make money from mud, we wouldn't have been the kind of people to have written mud in the first place. See, see what I mean? Yeah. Um, the, the game was supposed to be a way to get away from how dreadful the real world was and so that people could live in, uh, well, not so much live in, but they, they get to be themselves. They could be, be themselves, become themselves in this other world that we'd created. But... Other people get, we wanted other people to create worlds, we just want to make them ourselves. And so we let people play when anybody wanted to know how things work. We told them, we sent copies off to the university. We did stop people from making money from it. If other people wanted to make money from it, then we said, no, we don't want that. You know, this is the other. So it's kind of a bit like what these days would be um, the creative commons. Know, like, and... Yeah, yeah, like an MRT license or something, you know, the basic open source. Um, so, and and that's what what we did. So people could play our games. They liked them. They wrote their own. Some of them were better than ours. Some of them weren't. And and they went off in all these different directions. Um, now other people did come up with the same idea of a virtual world around the same time as us. Some um, slightly after. Some depending on what you mean by virtual world might have been before, but theirs didn't ever get anywhere. And the reason they didn't get anywhere was either because it was a some kind of a walled garden like the Plato ones, you know, you could only play on Plato, uh, that's Avatar on there, or um, they were making money like um, Scepter of Goth was and um, Island of Kesmai. They were also early and, they, and um, because they were making money, they didn't want people to have their source code. In fact, Scepter of Goth their source code was ripped off by one of the programmers who just took it and, uh, and set up his own game. So uh, and that was before um, you could do anything about stealing software. Um, so, but, but um, what it meant was that if they kept hold of their software and kept it like close to their chests, then in future, there weren't going to be many people who could code for it. Whereas with MUD, we got people who played MUD, they liked it, they wrote their own people like that. And we got generation, generation evolving very quickly. And by the time the 
games industry thought, hmm, these things here could make us some money. And they took on some programmers uh, or exp people had experience. Well, you know, there's a hundred mud people for every one from Kesmai or Scepter of Goth. So that's kind of why you're speaking to me now rather than speaking to Alan Cleats, who did Scepter of Goth or uh, Kelton Flynn, who did Alan of Kesmai. Um, either that or you've already spoken to them and I'm just third in line. <laughs> no. <laughs> no there's, I've always uh, th felt the same way that, you know, maybe you're, tr maybe you're not making that quick cash from something like that. But, but on the other hand, you get so much more uh, influence and you make such a larger impact on something by giving it for, away for free. Well, you get the impact, yes. Um, but it, I'm not trying to parlay the impact into um, a knighthood or anything. <laughs> the, the, oh, Sir Richard Bartle. The, <laughs> it's yeah, got a nice, nice yeah. ring to it. <laughs> yes, it would be, yes. I mean, the, the way these things work in the UK is if you create something that makes you a billion pounds, you get a seat in the House of Lords. If you create something that makes other people billions of pounds a year but don't make you any, then you don't get to be a, in fact, you get to be a, a professor in the computer science of <laughs> Essex University, in my case, uh, or a, a games uh, or a software design consultant in Roy Trubshaw's case. I should mention, I always have to mention this, it wasn't just me, it was two of us wrote mud, me and Roy Trubshaw. I'm just pointing over there, he's like 300 miles in that direction, but. Oh. <laughs> but um, well, it's interesting you should bring up this knighthood and the and the house of lords and all because one of the things i thought was really interesting of one of the interviews that i was uh, watching with you you said that the reason that you put levels into the game was a response to the inherent unfairness of the british caste system yes. and class. i just i want a oh, class system i was wondering if you got a caste i don't know where that came yeah, india i think uh, <laughs> uh that's a freudian slip i suppose but but anyway you know could you elaborate a little bit on that yeah yeah um the okay, so it's 1978, and you are a student at the University of Essex, um, and you're studying computer science. You're not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to be at university. No one in your family's ever been to university before. Um, the computer science is regarded as a low thing below electronics, which itself is regarded as a low thing beneath physics, which itself is regarded as a low thing beneath mathematics. We're at the bottom. We're kind of software engineers. Um, the only reason that we get to be at university is because there's a, a slight window um, where the, the country as a whole feels that it needs perhaps some people to do this software engineering. Um, now, the middle class parents, so they aren't going to send their children to be software engineers. I mean, what does, what does a software engineer do? Dig a hole in software and bury it? Uh, no. And soft, so they, they don't care. They want their children to be historians and art critics and perhaps economists and so on. Some of their children aren't all that bright and then, but they, so they can get them into the computer um, science. The other way, though, is that there are people who are very, very smart but come from a working class background. And that's where Roy Trubshaw and I and some of our friends came from. Um, I mean, we were, we were rich. My parents, my father was a gas fitter. You know, he spent all day installing cookers in people's houses. My mother was a school meals cook, so she cooked for you know, 30 primary school children or 50 or 100, however many there were. Trouble is, she still cooks like that. You know, I, I go to eat, and she make, there's one of us, me and maybe my wife, and she make, cooks the four. She probably no. makes really great rolls. <laughs> no, 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 she she cooks things. Oh, anyway. So the thing was, um, we, we got to university, and everyone else there is better off than us. We're looked down on because we're doing computer science. It's, you know, you call it a science, why is it a science, and so on. Um, and life sucked. Computing didn't suck. Um, computers were a, a, a form out, a way of freedom. And you, you found this a lot in um, what used to be called hacker communities. They're not called hacker communities anymore because hacking means breaking into someone's computer and stealing their data. Um, but um, back then, a hacker was somebody who was um, 
had an innate understanding of computing, like a, 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 um, they, they, they got them, they grokked them. And to, to get that kind of attitude, you needed to have a, a, like a view of the world, like a particular worldview. You, were, you had to think that computers were a force for good, that, that you could use them to change the world. And all the people who came to, the, who were what you would call hackers, they, weren't, they didn't kind of learn the culture from other hackers. It wasn't, we've learned your culture. It was, this is our culture. And, oh, wow, you feel the same way. So we naturally bonded all of us together. Um, and we all thought that the real world sucked because we were never going to get anywhere. Um, you know, we, we were only there because the people who had um, deigned to throw a few crumbs our way because computers might be something that would be worthwhile in, in the future. Oh, you could probably, you could, you could get your secretary to use one, you know, this sort of thing. And, and we, we raged against this. I mean, we were bottom of the pile. And the real world was, I mean, it, it sucked, it just sucked for us. Um, it was just n not a, not a lot of fun at all. Um, couldn't get uh, could, we we couldn't get girlfriends, um, and the, the, there were girls doing computer science, but they were like people, not girls. They were sort of people, so you know you'd say things like, um, uh, who, "Who who do you who you um, um, was, was was speaking to last night?" Oh well, let's see. There was a group of us. Let's see. There was um, Roy. He's quite tall. He's got a mustache. There was Kevin. He's big afro, he's black guy, big afro. There was there was Gail, she was a girl. And then there was Nigel, he's got like a hook nose. You know, it was like a physical characteristic. Oh. So you wouldn't ever treat a girl as anything other than a person if she was a computer scientist. They were all, you know, we were all just there together. And so we, we just couldn't get anywhere. Um, in, in, you, you speak to someone who's uh, doing their degree in art history or uh, literature or uh, philosophy or something and you know the way it works is uh, so um, you're computer science are you yes yeah, yeah all right so see this this is your heart yeah <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. okay so we didn't like the world. We didn't like it. Um, I thought computer nerds over here had it bad, but it sounds like you're <laughs> dealing with a whole different level. Yes, of, uh... yes. Well, yes, I, well, I'm probably getting the same as you, but in America you've got this vision of everyone can become the president. Um, in Britain, not everyone can become the queen. Um, and, I mean, I mean I've, my accent at the moment, I'm, I mean, I've lived in Essex for geez, uh, 35 years, but I've got a northern accent. I come from the north of England and I sound like a peasant to southern of England. When, so the south of England, it's like the opposite way around to America, where the, in Britain, the south is where all the, the power lies around London. And Roy comes from Wolverhampton and he's got a West Midlands accent. So he's, he speaks like this. What do you think you're doing? I don't know what you're going to do. I'm speaking like this. My accent goes up and down. And then um, and he's from Wolverhampton, which is slightly... So he, he's got this bit where, um, what do you think you're doing? I'm going to if he's asking a question, it goes higher and higher. So and he sounds like he should be working in a factory. But he's really, really smart. Um, I'm also really, really smart. And I've got the qualifications to prove it. Uh, <laughs> but it... But, it doesn't matter being really smart. Um, if people, as soon as you, you show up, as soon as you open your mouth, they've pigeonholed you because you're working class. Um, and we wanted a place where we could go, where none of this mattered, where who you were was based on your strength of character, or, or who you were as a person. And it didn't matter what, sex, gender, class, whatever you were, you could just go there and be and become yourself. And we, we never really discussed it at the time, Roy and I. It just sort of like we implicitly understood that this is what we wanted to do. And so we did it. We, um, we made, a, made a world. And it was very empowering for the people who played. And all the whole class thing just got out of the way. Everything went. It didn't matter what your accent was. It mattered if you could spell, 
but it didn't matter what your accent was. And and you got the freedom. It was always, always about the freedom to be and become yourself or to become and to be, I suppose I should say, yourself. So that's why we did it. We did it because we wanted to create a better world. Uh, having done so, we wanted the, that to spread. We wanted the real world to be better. So, of course, we were going to give everything away. If we didn't want to give it away, we wouldn't have been the kind of people who'd written it in the first place. Levels in mud were so that you could tell how experienced another player was. I looked at a number of th ways to... Um, uh, 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 when we started off... Uh, well, when, when Roy started off mud, um, it was he was trying to make a world. Um, and in, in the same way that the real world doesn't have levels like you don't have a number stamped on, okay just check in you don't have a number stamped on your forehead no, we just have degrees <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes yes but you can't but uh, but it's not it's not actually physically noticeable i am a kind of dalek by the look of thing um, <laughs> i i am um so uh um but in the in so he, he had the he had a world and it was all free film the idea being that the emergent interactions between player gave the con between players gave the content gave the things to do, but back then um, computers were less powerful than probably than the um, little camera that's pointing at me at the moment. I mean they were really bad. I got a photograph I show of my students of Roy Trubshaw and there are it's about two hundred and I mean, 300K, I think. There's more bits in that photo than we had to write mud. So it's, um, it, we didn't have the power to, to do that. So we had to make the, the world a game. And um, this is the point where I came, well, not the point where I came in, the point where I kind of took over um, because I was, I was the content person. Roy could do content, but really like programming. I could do programming, but really like content. Roy guys, did were about, you guys roommates or just no, friends? No, 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 just friends, yeah. Um, Roy did about a quarter of the coding, but it was the hardest part. I did about three quarters of the coding and maybe 90% of the content. Um, and when, it, um, when we decided, look, if we want people to play this, we'll have to make it into a game. And the word we use is gamify, which doesn't mean anything like it does now, but it did back then. It meant turning something into a game. Now it means turning something that isn't a game into something that maybe ought to be a game but they can't bring themselves to do it so um but we wanted but we wanted to make mud into a game um so i was looking at um ways i i knew you had to have intermediate goals uh, well uh, 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 that's what I'd, i concluded you needed things for people to aim at and i looked at a number of different models and i took uh, the levels one out dungeons and dragons in part because it's um it, it gives you clear clear goals you can you can see where you're going. But I also wanted it to have each level to have a personality so that when you're at each level, you could feel what that level meant. If you saw someone who was a level hero, that was different to seeing someone who was a level necromancer. And we only had about 12 levels, the highest being wizard stroke witch. Um, and that was the, the level that once you got to that, you're an ad administrator, you got administration powers. And, the reason for this was so that you could see yourself working up through. Um, uh, you'd see, see yourself rising. You weren't trapped down at one level. How far you got was depending on how good at mud you were or how many friends you had or how you conducted yourself. Things like this. Of a merit-based system. Yeah, merit-based, yes. Um, but the with the aim that in time, um, anybody, well, I say any, yeah, not anybody, some people really, really are stupid, but, um, <laughs> but most people could get to the top if they persevered and they, and in so doing, they'd come to understand more about themselves. I mean, it was kind of, it was built. Um, I, I wasn't aware at the time of this about, um, you know, journeys to self-understanding. Well, I knew they existed when Buddhism and stuff, but um, um, I wasn't aware of things like the hero's journey, that sort of thing, or narrative arcs, how, how they were structured. But I did have this sense that the more that you got to experiment with who you are, 
the better feel that you have of who you are and the better you'd be able to become who you are. You could try being a jerk, doesn't work out. So you don't. OK, some people are jerks and they like it. So, uh, OK, well, you've reached your level and haven't you? But other, but it was a way of of understanding. And, and it was specifically to address the, the, the class system. And it we really it was it was, look, this is what you've got. We don't want that. Go away. Um, later, we, we never I never, we never explained this to the, the players because players don't like the idea that they're being um, manipulated in any way. So we never explained any of that. It was just, this is how it was. And then people who came along who've made their own games, they thought, oh, well, Mud's only got 12 levels or however many it was at the time. So we'll have 20. That's so much better. And then others, oh, we'll have 50. We'll have 132. Yeah, yeah turn it all the way up to 11. Well, you know, the, the dial, I mean, it's... <laughs> So they never really got it, got why we had the levels and their levels left, lost personality. And then eventually you get so many levels, there may as well actually be experience points. Yeah. Sorry, I've ranted for quite a while here, but you did, you did, you did touch a... No, yeah, I mean, I agree. <laughs> I played a lot of MUDs too when I was growing up. And, mm. you know, I felt the same way, like this was a space. That part about you can kind of experiment, get away from people just judging you based on appearance or whatever and get to... Role play, I suppose, is really the the word yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's two sorts of role play, really. There's the here is the role, and you must fit yourself to it, which is mm. like acting. So, um, if you're playing Hamlet, you can't play Hamlet for laughs. Um, oh, I spotted your uh, Pac-Man, Pac-Man T-shirt. Huh? Oh yeah, it's Batman's uh, 35 today. So. Oh, <laughs> oh right. Uh, I should I should I think BioWare's 20, isn't it? I should have put my Pac-Man cufflinks on, but I didn't. You <laughs> get some Pac-Man uh, cufflinks. <laughs> I've, yeah, yeah, I've got Pac-Man cufflinks. I've got um, two sets of Pac-Man cufflinks. I've got um, Tetris cufflinks. I've got uh, the, um, breakout cufflinks. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, anything. Uh, plus dice, cards, several playing cards. Um, breakout. We said breakout cufflinks? Yeah, breakout, yeah. So those, were, like design, a, those were probably designed by Waz, but... Uh... Oh, <laughs> somebody else got the credit. <laughs> they're, they're just a, they're just someone. Someone's basically taking a screenshot and putting it on a little tiny square. Oh. But um, hey. Um. Anyway, I'm sure I was saying something important before I said that. So there. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much if you have supported my efforts at video game preservation, keeping these interview series with people like Dr. Bartle uh, coming. If you like this sort of thing, want to see more, please take a moment to go my by to uh, go by my Patreon site in the show notes there, and uh, you can support the show a dollar an episode, whatever you feel comfortable with is uh, very fine with me, and I appreciate it very much. So thank you. Oh, let's see. What about that news from the Mat Cave? Well, this week, uh, you know, I don't. I'm not one of those guys that, uh, you know, stays glued to the E3 updates and all that. So. Uh, there were a couple things from that that you guys sent that I thought was uh, interesting uh, to me. One was uh, uh, the Xbox Three, uh, Xbox One news. Apparently they are making it backward compatible. I looked into that and it looks like there's only about 22 games that are currently backwards uh, compatible at the moment. Uh, but I guess more is coming. I also heard about this trade-in deal uh, for the 360. So I actually went ahead jumped the gun on that, went to Best Buy, swapped my 360 for the Xbox One. I've been playing around with that a little bit. Uh, i got to say I'm not really impressed at the moment. Just uh, playing the old Halo games again. Of course, those are fun, but uh, I'm not really seeing a lot else out there that's exclusive to the Xbox One that really interests me. Uh, but I just got it, just kind of naive about it. So you guys that already have it, uh, let me know some games if you think that I need to play. Uh, let me know what those are. I was a little upset that I couldn't play my... Uh, 360 controllers wouldn't work with it either. That kind of sucks. So, 
just kind of been one disappointment after another with that thing. Uh, but, you know, let me know what the silver lining is. Uh, I guess Netflix moots a lot faster <laughs> than it did before. Really looking forward to Blu-ray, my f very first Blu-ray device. Uh, so I'm going to try that out hopefully next couple days. i got Mad Max Road Warrior on Blu-ray. Can't wait to try that. All right, some other news. Apparently, uh, The Shadow of the Beast is being rebooted. Uh, and unfortunately, there's no Amiga reboot to go with that. It's uh, going to be on the PS4. Uh, so I was taking a look at it. It didn't really look like anything that blew my mind, but I guess it's kind of cool that this franchise is still around. A little curious if uh, any of the original teams working on it uh, from, uh, what was it, Psygnosis, I guess? Or DMA Design? Not, not really... Sure, the old brain is uh, blinking at the moment. Uh, but anyway, let me know what you guys think of that project. And then uh, finally, Bard's Tale 4 is, uh, has been successfully funded now. They met their goal. It took a little longer than people expected, but they're there now. And they've got 20 days left to start hitting some stretch goals. And at 1.4 million, which is not too far away, I think there's a pretty good shot that they'll make that one at least. Uh, they'll get Monty Cook on board to do a dungeon you probably heard of him. He did a lot of uh, work for Dungeons and Dragons. I think he did uh, some, uh, what was it, Iron Crown stuff before that. So he's got a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, huge uh, body of works uh, from the tabletop stuff, and he, he really, know, you know, he knows what he's doing. So that's that's pretty exciting stretch goal. Anyway, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, so what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, I know a lot of you guys uh, don't drink ale. You don't drink alcohol. Maybe you're too young, or maybe it's against your uh, health or religion or whatever. But anyway, you don't drink. Uh, so I thought it'd be cool just for a little mini-series, I guess, uh, to try some exotic sodas on the show. And you guys, uh, <laughs> I guess there's probably people out there that don't drink beer or soda. You know, I, I feel really bad for you. Uh, but anyway, this looked pretty cool to me. This is a Leninade. Uh, get hammered and sickled, a taste worth standing in line for. Uh, this is non-alcoholic. I don't really know what the story is behind that, but it's got a pretty fun bottle on it. Some of this is in Russian. Surprisingly satisfying simple Soviet-style soda. But where the repressed Communist Party animal who is really a proletarian in, den in denial masquerading as a bourgeois Cold War monger? <laughs> Get really hammered and sickled. Our five-year plan. Drink a bottle a day for five years and become a hero of socialist flavor. Uh, so, I don't know if you'd want to be drinking this at a political rally, but it looked like fun. So, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this lemonade here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I'm smelling this. And, you know, I forgot to mention something else that's pretty cool uh, from the news section. Uh, they finally got around to putting gameplay, uh, my feature film documentary, on a DVD. That's all I know at this point. Hopefully they'll be getting some details uh, soon about where you can buy said DVD and all that. Uh, I'd, I actually think it'd be pretty cool if they had a Blu-ray version so I could play it on my Xbox One. That would be yet another application for that device, but... Ah, no news yet. This is smelling really interesting. I thought it would be very, uh, sort of smell like a Sunkist or one of those orange... Uh, sort of flavored drinks, but it's actually it smells more like just a Coca-Cola, maybe a Pepsi or an RC, if you remember that. I guess they're still around, right? RC. I used to call that kidney stone soda because it seemed like everybody I knew that drank those uh, ended up with kidney stones. And believe me, guys, you do. Or, gr or girls, too. Uh, you don't want to have a kidney stone. My dad had one. I think he described it as the closest that a man can come to experience the, the lights of childbirth. So... <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you all this right now. Uh, let's have a taste of this Leninade. Ah, smells really good. Well, let's smell, it says, what is that? Kind of a, you do taste a little citrus in that. Uh, you really smell sort of a lot of uh, sugar, I think. It's probably got, does it have cane sugar in it instead of that uh, high fructose corn syrup? I didn't check that. Smell, it tastes kind of like real sugar. Let's see, do they have a list of ingredients on there? There we go. Uh, yeah, cane sugar, what do you know? Now that is a, <laughs> is a palate, huh? 
A really, really tasty drink. Let me try it again. You taste a little bit of a kind of a lemony, a little bit of a light orange, maybe sort of a tangerine-like uh, flavor to it. It's supposed to be uh, lemonade. I don't know if that's a play on lemonade, but I don't really taste any lemon uh, sort of flavor in this. Maybe a bit more of a lime-tangerine uh, combination. It's a little bit like a Pepsi with a little bit of a, a, a lime, a little bit of an orange flavor. It's uh, quite tasty. I don't know if I want to drink this by the, by the gallon or anything like that, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty smooth too. It doesn't burn like uh, some of those uh, uh, Coca-Cola uh, sometimes do. Uh, you know, I don't really have a good scale for, for sodas at this point, but uh, you know, I like this. It's a pretty good, and I like the, I think you'd get some, a, a kick out of carrying around the bottle. And people would be like, what the heck is that, you know? So I'm going to go four out of five uh, drinking horns on this. Uh, it's, it's tasty, it's interesting, you know. Uh, no alcohol, but <laughs> you know, if that doesn't bother you, maybe you'd actually prefer it, uh, go check out the Lemonade. I have no idea where you might find this. Uh, I assume it's pretty, uh, pretty widespread, though. All right, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes about class systems and snobbery and all this stuff, and I found one uh, from uh, Michael Caine. It goes something like this. If someone has a very upper-class accent, you have a stereotype of him which is probably true. If someone has a working-class accent, you have no idea who you're talking to. See you guys next week. A self-perpetuating autocracy in which the working classes... Oh, there you go, bringing class into it again!